Hadoop is kind of its own VC, and Adam's going to do that because I don't know about Hadoop. And this is VC. Yes. First thing I'm going to talk about is uh, array jobs. Uh, I got Nora's smiling over there at this one. Um, Nora smiles at everything. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saved her serious time. I, I was hoping she was going to be here for this part because I was going to ask, ask her how much time she saved on this one. Um, the way an array job works is you submit, what we find is a lot of people submit the same job just with different data. So instead of saying, you know, creating a job that says, and run this program with this bit, and run a program with this bit, and run a program with this bit, and run a program with this bit, it's a lot easier to say, run a program with whatever I tell you next. So here in my Bayocat intro directory, I have things that I actually uh, got from, that I adapted from what Norma has. Nora and I worked on here. Um, I have a submit array you sub. And I'm going to show you what this does here. Let's do this. Okay. This is this is just a quick a quick script I put together that um, say it was based on some R work I was doing I was working with with more. I get my memory requirements, my runtime, uh, job number, gave it uh, an error with a task ID. Task ID is, is uh, it, some, some uh, variables that it can put into, into the scripts there. And then I tell it to run my program with array example dot r. Now, in array example dot r, I set up some constants here. I set up a job number. A job number is grabbing some. This is this is grabbing something from the environment. Environment variables. It had, it, it, the SGE will create what's called a task ID number when you submit an array job. So I say I want to submit this job with numbers 47 through 102. So what this did is it comes through, and the first time it comes through, it says task ID, and that's going to be number 47. So basically, this is just the way it's grabbing. <laughs> In Bash, it would just be dollar sign SGE task ID. Okay, this happens to be R, so it was you have to import that in a different way. And then I said grab this file name setup dash job number dot R, and then I and then I run some other program. So that way, in my other program here, what did I just say, darn it? Uh, there it is. I create, so I had set up dash one dot, dot r. And this is where I have the stuff specific for this job. So I can have, again, if I had 4702, I'd have set up dash 47, or set up dash 48, set up dash 49, blah, 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 up to, 40, set, up to set up dash. 102, and each one of these could have slightly different data in there. It could have, it could be referencing a data file. <coughs> it could be the data itself. It could, it, there's no size limitation. This just happens to be a small one because it worked out well, and this is what uh, Norm and I worked on. Now, every time a job goes gets submitted, it has to go through the job verification process, where it says that yes, this is a valid program, you're a valid user, all this kind of thing. If you create a whole bunch of jobs running for different data, it has to verify every single one of those that comes in the queue. And it can take a while. When you submit an array job, it does that one time. And it just says, oh, it's all there. We're all happy. Nora, how fast did that change oh, your time? Just a submission. I was, each, I, I was submitting one, uh, one job for each of the 120 uh, things I needed to, to run, and just the submission was taking over half an hour, just the submission. Uh, and with this, it, it submitted like this, so I can send now five, six of those batches of 120 in, in, in no time. So it, it, it made it, it, it helped it tremendously. 
particularly with those dead, dead short periods of time that you can't do anything with. You know, you've got to be staring at, at the screen for 15 minutes and, and to, to move on to the next step, but you don't have time to concentrate on anything else. So that was great. So that, that was the user testimonial I was hoping to have here. <laughs> <laughs> we, we took a lot of her stuff and, and, and moved it to these array jobs just for that purpose. And it doesn't make a whole lot of difference to the scheduler. It doesn't, it's not, you know, from the start, time your job start running to the time it ends, it's not going to make a big difference. It does make a lot of difference on your end and how much time it takes to do that. And it also allows you to create 1.2 million jobs. And with, we, we had uh, actually have somebody, uh, a CIS student, this uh, grad student this last year, who would at least once a week and usually once every two or three days would submit 40,000 jobs. They were small jobs and they would run through really quick, but you could watch our schedule and you'd see, bang, whole bunch, 40,000 at once, and then they'd work themselves off, and another big spike, that type of thing. We like that, we like seeing that type of thing, but just the, the time involved of doing that would be, would be overwhelming on, on just submitting the jobs. If you're doing, you know, she, she talked about that kind of time process from doing 120. 40,000 is another step beyond that. And it's all by using that environment variable, the SGE task ID, and you can use that within your, within what you get out of it. The way you do that, again, on the SGE webpage, I bet if I say array, I'll get the right spot. Right at the very top, there's a section on array jobs, and it will tell you the limitations, provisos, <coughs> quick pro quos, any references, the Latin I got there, nobody taught me anyway. Um, but it, it tells you how to submit those jobs, which is dash T, N being the first number, M being the last number. And there's step sizes and things like that you can do too, but most people will just say from, like, you know, 47-102, and that's how it'll it'll run your program. So it's a very handy tool, and if you know that it can be done, and even if you you know you get confused by the web pages, give us a call because we much prefer to see you know one job in the queue with lots of parameters on the end because at least that way we know what's going on, as opposed to seeing 100 jobs in in the queue that may or may not be the same thing. The next thing is also on this page. <coughs> on your number of cores that you ask for, come on, find it. I think you missed it. Did I? Yeah. Fine. I have it on here. I have it on my slide. You know what? There. Once again, it uses the n slots command, uh, n <coughs> slots environment variable. So, in this case, I was using uh, single parallel environment, so it's all on one machine. But I said we can use either two or three, four or five, six, seven, eight, or ten or sixteen cores. It's kind of, you know, most of the time it'll be, you know, either a multiple of, you know, a power of two or it'll be a range of five through eight or something like that. But this shows you the power of the command there. Instead of just putting a number, you say, you know, 16, I need 16 cores. If you want, this will speed your job along. If it'll schedule in the system, maybe it'll schedule the system a lot sooner. Say, well, yeah, I can run on eight or I can run on four, that type of thing. This works really well with OpenMP. If you use that command, it, it'll, uh, it'll give the n slots environment variable. You can use that n slots within OpenMP for your max number of threads. And that way, OpenMP will use whatever it has available. Not saying that it's limited to OpenMP, but that tends to be the, the best use case for that. And again, so why is it useful? Because it'll schedule your job perhaps more efficiently. I mean, if it if happens to have, you know, 16 cores open, 
It'll give you 16. If it only has 10, it'll give you 10. And so it's a way of getting your job started faster. Any other questions about this before we go to Hadoop? Yes. I tell you, uh, if you start with like this up to 16, so and availability is like uh, tenfold, and uh, suddenly uh, it's more available. It will will it increase to 16? No, not once the job starts running. Oh, if you start with two, it will keep on running with two. Right. However, when you couple that with array jobs, if you if you have several jobs running that you can. It's only it's only on the one on the one that job that's running. So if you have an array job that you've submitted a hundred different things and it schedules the first one with just a couple cores, then it scores, schedules the next one with more. It it will take it will it will schedule those with different number of cores for the different tasks within that one array job. Does that make sense? Can you do the same thing with like when you request for memory? Can you request for a range? No. No. For time. Okay. Any more questions before we move to Hadoop? Uh, let's say if I request 10 CPUs in my shared group, mm -hmm. but actually in my program, actually, I stay from parallel in 16 thread, mm -hmm. what's going to happen? It will try to use 16, and you'll probably get some angry sysadmins that kill off your job if it gets too aggressive. <laughs> Because <laughs> sometimes I will get modified parameters in there. Um, one, of the, one of the things that will happen is if, for instance, if you're, the, if you're not bothering other users, uh -huh. so say for instance you asked for four cores and your job accidentally used eight or 12 or 16, but you're only the only user on that node, they might just keep an eye on it and say, yeah, he's only hurting himself. Go ahead and uh, let it run. But Particularly if we notice that your job is harming others, and this happens a lot in memory, for instance, where somebody will ask for eight gigabytes and they start using, you know, 200 or something, and it starts pushing out other users, uh, then we will terminate it with prejudice and send you a nasty email. Anything else? Oh, I was going to just real quick. CUDA, we have stuff on the website for doing that. I'm not going to go over here primarily because it's a big pain in the rear and I bore you all to tears with it also. But CUDA is the GPU computing. Um, it's, it's very much like MPI, the, the cost of getting stuff into and out of the GPU is really expensive time-wise. Once it's in there, it's very efficient. So uh, you can compile those with the MVCC command and, and uh, use sub with the, say you, you need CUDA as one of your resources. Adam. Okay. Turn it over to you. <laughs> Here, you can even have the microphone too. All right. Well, this will be interesting. Uh, I finally got to do working on Friday, so I've done minimal testing. Our uh, Hadoop setup is brand new. We, we've, we've set aside 10 nodes and about 10 terabytes of disk space and 160 cores, 640 gigs of RAM, specifically for Hadoop jobs. Um, previously, we were forcing users to submit a Baocat job and it would set up an entire Hadoop environment within that job just for them. Uh, this is problematic mostly because we, uh, uh, <coughs> using multiple nodes in that kind of setup is really painful, getting the right number of tasks is really painful, um, even making sure you're not stepping on other users because Hadoop likes to use as many cores as it can. It, it, it all becomes very painful in terms of scheduling and being useful in general. So, anyway, for those who do not know, Hadoop is a MapReduce framework. Um, it's a framework that influenced influence that programming paradigm. You write jobs that, that, that split or sort the imported data into queues, into smaller sets to be processed. Uh, we then process that, those queues, in parallel and produce kind of a summary information of the, the, the types of information you're trying to pull out of it. Uh, some people will be using this for network flows. So you got all information about all of the networking traffic across campus. You could put all of that into Hadoop, try and pull out information about which direction they're going. Are they coming in? Are they coming out? Are we tending to go up to the cloud? 
are we doing more HTTP traffic than 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 uh, uh, SSL traffic? That kind of thing. Um, within a MapReduce job, you would be you would have a jar file. This is this is going to be the jar, or this is going to be the job itself. You've got a job class. It's it's all written in Java, so uh, th these are the the, the Technical terms for some of those. You'd have a job class which would define what you need, the configuration parameters, uh, how many threads you want to run, how much memory you want each, each task to have, that kind of thing. Uh, you'd have a mapper class which would sort the data into, the, into your queues. You'd also have a reduce class which would uh, consolidate and summarize all of your data. In this case, you've also got your own separate file system. So your home directory is not in the not in Hadoop at the moment. Um, to put data, data into it, you're going to do a file system put and put it, and name the file and put it in. You also need to pull it back out with a get. And because we're limited to 10 terabytes, please clean up your Hadoop file system when you're done. <laughs> if, if it's no longer needed, get rid of it. All right. Let's start with a Hadoop example. Oh, let me log in over here. <coughs> I'm just getting my session set up, so. Because this is a new setup, uh, we actually have a separate head node for Hadoop. We've got Athena, we've got Minerva. Uh, to get into the Hadoop stuff, we're going to SSH into Thea, which I have not had a chance to put all this up on the wiki yet. It will be there, but it's not there yet. Um, let's see. Logged into Thea. You can see you've got your normal home directory mounted there. But it is, it, it's where you're going to log in to do Hadoop things. Now, if we take a look here, we would do a, a make dir. Uh, I don't know if you can see that or not. Let me. Now we, we do a Hadoop FS and then dash make dir, guess that is. And then we make this directory data.in. Oh. Sorry. Apparently I can't type on this keyboard. Same thing as she Kyle was. Okay, we've now created a folder uh, data.in in my Hadoop file. You can take a look and be sure about that by doing a Hadoop uh, fs dash ls and then slash user Moses, because that's my name. So if we take a look here, we have four, five files in there. We've got staging, we've got a data.in, we've got a DNA big.in, we've got an output folder. So now we do a Hadoop. No, it was not said we want to actually put a file in there. So we do Hadoop fs dash put. My file. See if I can actually type. It's horrible today. Uh, DNA medium. Let me put that in data.in. DNA medium. For instance, I'm just putting in a big DNA file in there. 
So that gets put in. Um, because this file system, uh, Hadoop currently runs with a replica of three. So it has three copies of any data you put in, put into it to make sure that A, you can always get to it. And because the way Hadoop runs, it tries to start off your ma your map and reduce tasks as close to your data as possible. And so that gives it more places that it can start those tasks. We've now done my put. I want to look in data.in, make sure a file got put there. And DNA medium is in data.in. So now, the dupe jar. So we are going, we're getting ready to run our actual job finally. User lib Hadoop. Map reduce and then Hadoop examples. It's really noisy. Okay. Now in this case, I'm going to want to run a word count on DNA data.in because it asks for a file. And I want to give my, I want to give it an output. Oh, sorry, word count is not capitalized in this case. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So we're gonna run a job here. It reads in that jar file. That's just an example jar, jar file. It goes through, opens that file, count, counts all of the unique words in that. And so it takes all that data, you see here, it's doing a map. So it's sorting all those all that data into queues. In this case, it's gonna be about 112 of them just because that's about how large this job is. And now it's starting to reduce and, uh, and summarize that data. With, you know, and most of these jobs, I have, I, I, all the people I've seen using Hadoop have been writing their own code. So you're going to wanna get in and learn the framework if you're wanting to use Hadoop. Um, so I, I'd use this if you have IO intensive jobs, mostly because um, it tries to keep the computation as close to <coughs> your, uh, your data as possible. And so you end up with less network traffic, you end up with less IO overhead, that kind of thing. So that's where this is at. And it just finished, it took a couple minutes to read through uh, DNA-M. DNA, the medium DNA file was almost a gigabyte, and so it processed that. It gave us a word count. Um, when you're done with that, you would want to do a Hadoop uh, fs-get, <coughs> and then we've got our out folder, and we say, we give this a name, Word count for instance. And that should pull the entire folder out and give us good information as to what's in there as soon as it finishes. Um, but remember, the Hadoop file system and our, your normal home directory file system, those are unique. And so your data, you, you actually do have to move data in and move data out between these two. So now we pull the word count dot out. We have this folder. We have a we have a underscore success file. Okay, that's just created to make sure that when, when the job is done. Uh, part dash r zero. That is the output full file that this creates, and it tells you how many counts there are in this format that they decided to output it. Um, do we have any questions? Is there anything else you want to know about Hadoop or how to use it? Uh, like I said, I've not got my documentation up to date yet just because of, I finally got it working on Friday, but uh, it will be up shortly. Alan, what, what type of jobs do you envision being able to make optimal use of Hadoop? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, 
generally, the types of jobs that have lots of data, but very, a, a very high, uh, a very high, a very low signal noise rate ratio. So you've got a lot of a, a lot of noise in your data set. You want to collate out just the stuff that that matters to you. Like I was talking about network flows earlier, where you've got that, you've got you, we can get data from about all all the network traffic across campus and where it's going and that kind of stuff. But we can't analyze that. We can't make use of it in real time. Mostly, just the, just too much data for anybody to use. So you have to go through and you have to parse out what's useful. And that's what this is supposed to be able to do. Uh, I've honestly never used it for anything more than these tests, but I do know we've got several people here. Actually, we've got at least one user in the department that teaches the class on this. Mm -hmm. And we've got, in fact, the whole reason I'm setting this up is because uh, I, I, I was, our, the way we, we, we were setting up a Hadoop environment and a job was causing another user's jobs to crash. Because mm -hmm. he was, he was, so he wasn't able to do his re research with him to do. So. So typically, Hadoop is used for a large-scale data mining job. <coughs> You've got a lot of data. Each individual little bit of the data doesn't really need a lot of processing. And so Hadoop takes it, divides it over the data, puts it over a parallel file system so you get lots of bandwidth because you're using lots of hard drives simultaneously to do some processing on it. So Google, for instance, did one of the original implementations of MapReduce because they're looking, they're mining links. Where do these links go? And they've got petabytes and petabytes of data. And so Hadoop does great things like it, for instance, will say, hey, if I need to run 5,000 copies of this, under a normal scheduler, the odds of 5,000 jobs simultaneously working together on huge amounts of data for a long period of time are about zero. Um, but Hadoop, for instance, provides an environment where if the job dies, it'll automatically restart it. Or it'll say, hey, you're done now, go off and work something. It does a lot of the hard work of managing really big data-based, not databases, but data-intensive type calculations on a large scale. Mm -hmm. our, our system really isn't big enough to take advantage of that, but a lot of our users, particularly in bioinformatics, are looking at it and saying either a lot of their colleagues they're working with are using Hadoop so we have an environment where they can be compatible, mm -hmm. or they're saying let's build model systems with this relatively small Hadoop system so we can go to partners with much larger systems that are using Hadoop to do these type of data mining, big data, data intensive type jobs. Okay. Beocat is set up more for compute intensive type tasks. And Hadoop is more of a data intensive type task. And so, for instance, if we get the NSF MRI that I've proposed, where we're asking for four petabytes of disk and such, that's much more aimed at more Hadoop style environments and it'd be at a scale where it'd probably be worth it. Right now, it's mostly just a headache for Adam. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Any questions about anything up until this point? Or through the other sections? I think you guys have done a great job of actually thinking uh, what you can do with the OCAP. Um, I would say, uh, now that you've had a chance to attach some faces to EIDs, so. Mm -hmm. That's Adam, that's Kyle in the back there. Uh, and we swapped, and I'm Dan. Um, please, you know, we, we typically aren't terribly omniscient or telepathic, so if you're having difficulties, let us know. We'll see if we can update our documentation or get together with you, help train other users and uh, solve issues. And sometimes we may have to say, look, we can't, but we'll sure, sure try not to, not to do that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing is probably there will be a survey that'll come out in the next day or two, is my guess, just saying, hey, what'd you think, where could we do better? And uh, as I've stated, feel free to be brutally honest, both in the positive and negative senses, and uh, let us know, because this is the first time we've done this and we're gonna be doing it again. And so if there's something we can do to make it better, that'd be good to know. So thanks, appreciate your time, I don't take it lightly. We're always happy to update our documentation. I know it can be a wall of text at some times, but it's coming out from where we are at, it, it's, it's hard to see it from a new perspective. So if you have any better ideas about what helped you learn or that kind of stuff, we would love to try and incorporate that. And for professors and PIs and those writing papers, if you use Beocat significantly for a paper, 
if you would cite us and cite our grants, that makes my uh, overlords at the NSF a whole lot happier. <laughs> so uh, if you would be so kind, that'd be great. There's directions on the VOCAT website for how to do that. And if you feel like you'd like more priority for your jobs, talk to your uh, funding agencies and talk to your professors and say, hey, how about uh, slipping a little cash VOCAT's way and that helps your priority on the system. So. <laughs> <laughs> In, in some sense, we are very corruptible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you much. And feel free to clean out the snacks on the way out the door so I don't have to deal with them.